Segoli, Nadio Lewis, Skanagoga, Skanago. I just said in Oneida. Greetings, what is the news? Are you with peace? I am with peace. It is me, Dr. Reed, also known as Liguadio Oneida, for he is a good man. It is an honor to be with you all, Vermont Law and Graduate School, for week two of restorative justice in Indigenous communities. It's been an honor getting to know you all through your responses and your, your introduction of self for your week one responses for our community peacemaking circle on group me. Thank you so much for jumping in there and sharing your agreements. It's such an honor to put our minds together. So be it in our minds, as we say in the Oneida tradition, which is one of six nations of the Haudenosaunee. And as this notion of peacemaking, this notion of restorative justice is one that is not only for the Oneida or the Haudenosaunee, but it's one for many peoples across what we call Turtle Island of North and South America, indigenous peoples in Africa and different peoples across the world who uh, Maoris and New Zealand and different peoples who have practiced some type of circle practice of putting our minds together for the purpose of harmony and peace and balance. And let me share with you all our week two, uh, our week two slideshow here. So thank you all very much for being here today. You all could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us and I thank you for that. So let us continue on people. So in the constitution itself, it says, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, which is the Indian Commerce Clause in the Constitution, which states that the federal government is to regulate commerce with foreign nations, among the several states, and with the Indian tribes. And I think this is incredibly important to recognize in the Constitution itself. It outlines this nation-to-nation -nation relationship of a sovereign to a sovereign in the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Also going in, when we're looking at Indigenous peoples, we're looking at particularly for Indigenous peoples in the United States, we're looking at the Declaration of Independence, this document that's oftentimes talked about being a prolific human rights document. Well, when we go to paragraph 29, it talks about how he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontier, the quote, merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So to be in the Declaration of Independence, talking about native peoples who are here, whose form of governance, the Haudenosaunee and community peacemaking with the great law of peace, is who the United States form of government is based off of these ideals. So we'll talk about more about that later on in the class and in this lecture. I want to talk about some impactful federal policy towards indigenous peoples, including but not limited to just some of these to get an overall, overall idea of the different laws and statutes which pertain to native peoples. Well, the Doctrine of Discovery in 1493 is a palpable bull put forth by the Catholic Church staying, stating that any lands that are not inhabited by Christian peoples are therefore considered heronolius or void earth or empty earth. And this is still active until this day, which has not been rescinded and it is still active and it has been used in a Supreme Court case in the early 2000s with Oneida County versus Oneida Nation versus Sherrill County of New York, where it was then used as precedent as well too. So let us continue on. Going on to the Indian Commerce Clause in the Constitution, which we outlined a moment ago, Congress transferred the responsibility for managing trade relationships with tribes to the Secretary of the War by its Act of August 20th, 1789, 1 Statute 54. Then it goes to the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which was the, India, the legalized displacement and the forced removal of native peoples. A famous example of such would be the Trail of Tears by the Cher Cherokee Nation. And there would be over 30 different long walks or different tribes that have been forced to do these long walks where it was not about the preservation of peoples. It was about moving these peoples off of these lands to different places. We go to the Major Crimes Act of 1885, which allowed for the federal government to have jurisdiction onto tribal nations if it was for a major crime, which included murder, kidnapping, and a number of other crimes as well. The Dawes Act of 1887, also known as the Indian Allotment Act, was which parceled off at one point all of Oklahoma, as we know it today, was all one point of what we'd call Indian country or all these, like a, a large reservation. Indian country is the term today is also used when describing reservations of people across, the native people across Turtle Island as well too. We consider North America or United States and but for this particular notion of uh, the Dawes Act, it was putting peoples in Oklahoma, and then it was land that was promised to, to native tribes was then parceled off and sold off to different peoples uh, in as uh, settlers were coming across the United States. We then go to the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, 
And before this, Native peoples were not U.S. citizens. So, for instance, when my great grandfather served in World War One, him and 12,000 other Native people serving in World War One for the United States would be doing so without being U.S. citizens. So it wouldn't be until 1924 that Native people regranted U.S. citizenship. And this would be advocated heavily by Zit Kalashaw as well, too, a Native activist. There is the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, looking to... This idea around that period of this Indian New Deal of trying to give different rights to tribal nations. We have the Public Law 280, which many Native legal scholars have argued as a, a massive depletion towards sovereignty or an attack on Native sovereignty. As Public Law 280 in 1953 shifts this inherent relationship in the federal government in our constitution between tribal nations and the federal government, and it shifts that between tribal nations and a state, which is to say that a, a tribal nation is now being treated the same way as it would a local municipality or, for instance, a city, a county on a state level, as opposed to being a, a nation to a nation on a federal level. So Public Law 280 uh, initially had some states, and now it has eight states and counting. At any point, legislation could be passed to, to remove Public Law 280, and yet it continues to this day, and I believe is an attack on tribal sovereignty. Going to the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, where a lot of advertisements were put out by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to trip different tribal nations across Turtle Island. And it was advertising for people to come to major cities, come to Los Angeles, come to Seattle, come to Oakland, come to New York, Chicago, a number of other major cities with the promises for Native peoples of housing, of jobs, education. And many of these things were over-promised and under-delivered, that when many people were bussed off of their areas and into different places, uh, oftentimes of extreme poverty, there are different peoples who have said in interviews that this is just where we came from. You know, we just we just came from this. We can't just came from poverty. Like, what are we doing here? So many people, uh, if it was their first paycheck, then they, had, then they were giving no more extra support, or some people, they were not given even support up to this extent as well, too. But it's one of the reasons why, for instance, in Los Angeles, California, it's as low as number three I've seen and as high as number one for most densely populated Native peoples in a county as well, too. So a lot of Native peoples have lived in major cities as well, too. We go to the Voting Rights Act in 1965. As before then, many Native peoples did not have the right to vote and diff other different people of color as well, too. So this helped ensure those rights for the to be able to be active in our government. The Family Planning Services and Population Research Act of 1970 was actually an act that legalized the hysterectomies without the rightful consent or knowledge of Native people and other women of color as well, but particularly at least 25% of Native women or more had been given these hysterectomies without the rightful consent, and it was this Family Planning Services and Population Research Act of 1970, which made it legal to do so. The Indian Self-Determination Act of 1975 which we had different eras before this, which we could say the Indian Removal Act was an era of extermination. The, we have the Termination Act with uh, this like termination era. We're trying to assimilate Native peoples, starting like with the Citizenship Act and um, up until this notion of 1975, which would be the Self-Determination Act. So I've heard it said that people, that tribal nations, whether good, bad, or otherwise, but we would give these peoples to have their, have their own, the keys to their own destiny, so to speak. So they would be able to have their chance uh, to be able to decide how they are to act as a sovereign, as a tribal nation. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act in 1978, as even though one of our core fundamentals of the United States is the freedom of religion, Native peoples would not be given that right until 1978. And as we'll explore further in Supreme Court rulings, that even then, even after the reaffirmation of the Religious Freedom Act of 1996, Native peoples would, are still fighting for their rights for religious freedoms, particularly when it comes to environmental and sacred practices and traditions. So Native people still fighting for this right even after the passage of this le legislation in 1978. Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988, which allowed Native peoples, uh, tribal nations, federally, tribal na federally recognized tribal nations to have casinos as a way of generating income if they wanted to. Going on to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act in 1989, anything that looks like it's supposed to be made from a Native person actually is supposed to be made by a Native person or is supposed to have uh, benefits that directly benefit tribal nations themselves. And I, I still see this being broken all the time, examples being such of the Jeep, Jeep Grand Cherokee, the Oneida Silverware, I'm, I'm Oneida Nation, and to my understanding, this Oneida Silverware has nothing to do with the Oneida Nation, but benefits from it without giving 
giving money to different peoples, or maybe you've seen these in different designs or clothing, whether it's a medicine wheel or different things of uh, traditional patterns of native native designs, which can still be used without giving rightful rec uh, rightful recognition, or even so, rightful right uh, rightful financial rights to the to peoples who this is being taken from and benefited from, or having native artists themselves being the people who are uh, creating these things. Native American Languages Act of 1990. I was born in 89, so when I was a child uh, growing up in the bathtub, my grandma would sing to me in Oneida. She'd say, snagila, snagila, wa," which means drink milk, drink milk, drink milk, just like a pig, which is, seems like a silly, fun thing. However, it would have been illegal up until uh, uh, that first year my grandma was doing that. And even so, I think about all the different peoples at these Indian boarding schools in, uh, in the United States, Indian residential schools in Canada, where this notion was to kill the Indian to save the man where the idea was to get rid of language, traditions, culture, religion, clothing, ways of expressing ourselves in the universe. So this would be a Native American Languages Act, which would make it legal for Native people to speak their language for the first time, even though maybe you've heard of the film Wind Talkers, which is a, about the Navajo Code Talkers and how this, this language was helped to use to win conflicts. And also there'd be 30 other tribal nations whose languages were used in war, in conflict with the United States to, to help win these conflicts, even though it was still illegal to speak their languages at the time. We then go to the violence, uh, well, we will go to the Native American Graves and Rep Repatriation Act of 1990 that says that any time that remains are found or buried or, or have been dug up, that these remains are supposed to be returned to Native peoples or these artifacts or different things. And we're seeing this now in different universities and museums as conversation happened about right now about, about our people following the law of the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. Are these different artifacts, cultural remains and burial items being returned to the tribal nations whose they belong to and who they, who they come from and derive from? We now go to the Violence Against Women Act, which in case you've heard of this, this notion of missing and murdered indigenous peoples, missing and murdered indigenous women, sometimes you'll see the example of the, uh, uh, the over a face, like a red, red uh, handprint, and this is to also to, to note the media silence on the issue as well, too. For instance, during the COVID pandemic, there was this horrific tragedy of Gabby Petito, who was, was, had gone missing and then was murdered. And in just in that same area where Gabby Petito had gone missing, and just in the decade before that, uh, uh, roughly 710 other Native women had gone missing during, that, during just a decade long in that same area, yet without the same media attention. So there's uh, many different... Uh, those, the numbers are very high in terms of like uh, trying to find out that actual number of what that is in different databases. And there's been, we'll skip ahead to different, different acts like Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act of 2020, which had taken different databases, which before were completely isolated, whether it was a tribal information or a city, county, states, federally, and it started to collect all these databases to, to actually try to find out how can we do our best to help find these peoples and bring justice to these people as well too. So the Violence Against Women Act, first put forth in 1994, and then reaffirmed in 2013 and 2022, each time adding a slightly more in terms of the repercussions for these things, whether it's financially or more time in jail when these issues occur. There still is a disproportionately high amount of violence and sexual assault towards Native women. And I've seen the number as low as roughly over 80% and as high I've seen as 92% uh, are being committed by non-Native perpetrators as well too. As we go along here to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, this was put forth in 2007. And while it was, it was not initially signed by the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, and because of its notion of having to honor treaties and the, recognizing the rights of the Indigenous peoples on the area as well too, there would later be an American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2016. Now, this does not have the same legislative teeth or impact. It's more of a, a, a recognition of the Native peoples who are here still. And we have right now, it's before Congress, which has not been passed yet. It's the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act, which would be, right now we have examined one Indian boarding school so far, which is Carlisle Indian Boarding School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, one of the first Indian boarding schools. This is where my great-grandfather was forced to attend, where my great-grandfather, my great-great-uncle had uh, was killed there. Joshua Cornelius, and the notion was uh, if we were to explore more, as each of these schools by design had a cemetery on campus. Carlel has 180 for the known children and 13 for the unknown children who are undistinguishable after death. 
And this is just one school of the over 450 Indian boarding schools in the United States, over 150 Indian residential schools in Canada. Some schools have been looked at a little more in Canada as well too, but it's still just a fraction of, of still there in terms of the acknowledgement, education and honoring of the peoples who've gone through that and uh, their stories and to honor these peoples and to, so we in an attempt to heal. Let's talk about some influential court cases. You can take a, a grand look at it right now. We'll briefly go through some of these as well too. So Johnson v. McIntosh is the beginning of what's called the Marshall Trilogy and it is an important one and not in a great way for indigenous sovereignty. And then it talks about how the decision says that Indians have only a right of occupancy and hold no title to the land. Chief Justice John Marshall bases the decision on the doctrine of discovery, as we talked about that palpable from 1493, so that it was became precedent. This notion would be forced to have the separation of church and states. Well, this palpable bull became precedent for this notion that Indians only have a right of occupancy for native peoples. Cherokee Nation versus Virginia is 1831 and argues that the Cherokee were a dependent nation with a relationship to the United States like that of a, quote, ward to its guardian, as said by Chief Justice Marshall. So again, this kind of, this reasoning, this ruling cut out of thin air then becomes precedent, which can be used further uh, in the future for this notion that it's ward to its guardian, which would be people who would be going through our foster care system in the United States. This would be a similar ver verbiage or term. This is this uh, notion how the United States saw Native nations in this legal case in 1831. 1832, heard this pronunciation says Wooster versus Georgia, and it recognized that the whole intercourse between the United States and its nation is by our constitution vested in the laws and the government of the United States. So it's trying to recognize that in the case of the Cherokee Nation, it wasn't between, Cherokee, uh, wasn't between the state of Georgia and the Cherokee Nation, that they had no power here. That really it was because uh, this is a really reaffirmation of tribal sovereignty for the Cherokee. It's supposed to be this nation to nation relationship. Ex parte v. Crow Dog in 1883 is an important case as it really would be the formal end to restorative justice for tribal peoples. And sometimes we get caught up in the verbiage and the, in the, the word of restorative justice, whether this is community peacemaking. However, this particular example, let's dive into it here. The Crow Dog case in 1883 was a U.S. Supreme Court case that put tribal restorative justice to the test. The Lakota Nation had made its own resolution, but the surrounding Americans did not like their resolution. The lower court tried and convicted Crow Dog and was going to execute him. After an appeal, the U.S. Supreme Court found that an Indian on Indian crime on Indian land is Indian business. Right after that, Congress created that Major Crimes Act in 1885, which we talked about before. But again, so it's saying that the Lakota Nation had its own resolution, had included horses, it included some financial aspects, and the lower courts tried to convict Crow Dog and was going to execute him. But then the U.S. Supreme Court found the tribal sovereignty here. But however, this was an attack on restorative justice as tribal nations have been using it for millennia, thousands of years. Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, 1903, says that Congress has a power to modify or terminate Native American treaties without the Native Americans' consent, which does not seem like a very fair treaty or keeping people's promises. Winters, this is the United States, 1908. The United States itself could abrogate rights granted to the Indians under a treaty with them. It alone had this power. So it's saying that businesses weren't allowed to do this, that they had to honor those treaties. But the United States, they were allowed to abrogate or terminate or not abide by these treaties which they had created with the, tri with the tribal nations. Morton versus Mankari, 1974. It's a, this is allowed to have hiring preferences given to Indians within the Bureau of Indian Affairs to have tribal peoples with this cultural understanding and lived experience. Oliphant versus Suquamish, 1978. Recognize that Indian tribal courts have no criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. Again, this would be an attack on tribal sovereignty in terms of how sovereignty is carried out. If you look at this like matrices of when do tribal, when is tribal sovereignty applied to different peoples? And in this case, it's saying that these Indian tribal courts, that tribal nations have no criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians on their territories in terms of able to carry out justice or protect their peoples. Definitely a detriment to tribal sovereignty. United States versus Sioux Nation of Indians, 1980. The Sioux, also known as Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. Between those, there's nine nations uh, total, but oftentimes referred to in English as the Sioux. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court awarded the nine tribes constituting the Ogala Sioux $105 million for the illegal se seizing of the sacred Black Hills, which broke the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, which according to the U.S., according to the Constitution, the Supremacy Clause, the treaties are the supreme law of the land. In 2011 alone, this trust had increased to $1.3 billion, 
However, the tribes refused the money as they believe accepting the funds would constitute a transaction of sale of lands, and the tribal nation's leaders emphasized how the land was never for sale in the first place. Ling versus Northwest Cemeteries, 1988, does not prohibit the government from harvesting timber or constructing a road through the portion of the National Forest that is considered a sacred religious site. So notice this is 10 years after the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, and yet you're seeing that the it's still, um, there's still an attack on tribal peoples being able to carry out their re- traditional sacred ceremonies and religious ceremonies. Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians versus Holyfield, 1989, that the Indian Child Welfare Act governed adoption of Indian children, and that a tribal court had jurisdiction over a state court if the child or the national parents resided on the reservation. This will have to do with what's called, the, in terms of that Indian Child Welfare Act, that tribal, that when a tribal, uh, when a native child is put up for adoption, that they're first supposed to go with someone from their immediate family. And if it can't be from them, someone from their extended family, if not them, then someone from their tribe, if not their tribe, someone from a different tribal nation, just as it's noted from studies, even from the American Psychological Association in the 1970s, how important it is for tribal people in their upbringing to have this cultural alignment, this cultural sensitivity, this sense of cultural awareness, and just how, how, foundational and fundamental that can be in a person's upbringing for their identity. United States versus Laura, 2004, recognized both the United States and a Native American tribe could prosecute an Indian for the same acts that constituted crimes in both jurisdictions. So in this case, as opposed to what we normally have, what uh, is called double jeopardy in the U.S. in our in our U.S. law system, that someone cannot be tried for the same crime twice. And in this case, it's this notion that they that they are allowed to have this tribal court in a U.S. court, and it's not double jeopardy here. This is this 2005 case I was talking about when it comes to City of Cheryl, New York petitioner, the Oneida Indian Nation of New York. And some of the reasoning there by Ruth Bader Ginsburg is under the doctrine of discovery, the fee title to the land occupied by the Indians when the colonists arrived became vested in the sovereign, meaning first the discovering European nation and later the original states in the United States. And again, this has not been rescinded yet. This doctrine of discovery is still can be used as precedent that lands that are not inhabited by Christian peoples are therefore terra nullius or empty earth or void earth, even though there's people already living there. In this case, the Turtle Island in North America has been estimated time of settlers coming in 1492, anywhere from 1 million to 100 million people, and some would estimate between 16 million to 32 million people. Navajo Nation versus U.S. Forest Service, looking at the Ninth Circuit in 2008 ruling, recognized that artificial snow containing sewage water was used on the sacred San Francisco, San Francisco peaks. Now the Navajo people, also known as the Diné, meaning the people, and 12 other nations made an appeal under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to stop this. However, the Ninth Circuit ruled that this was not a quote, substantial burden on the religious freedoms of American Indians. Even though the claims were saying, please do not do this. If you're putting the snow containing sewage water on our sacred San Francisco peaks, you are decimating it, you are, uh, this is sacred to us. Please do not do this. And yet it was still not a quote, substantial burden on the religious freedom of American Indians. Bracken v. Zinc. This was an attack on ICWA. And it's recognized that the Northern District of Texas declared that the Indian Child Welfare Act and its implementing federal regulations are unconstitutional. And this would then eventually be going to the Supreme Court, which we'll check back in on in a moment. McGurk v. Oklahoma in 2020 ruled that much of the Eastern portion of the state of Oklahoma remains as Native American lands of the prior Indian reservations, which was never disestablished by Congress as part of the Oklahoma Enabling Act in 1906. Remember when we talked about that Dawes Act, the Indian Allotment Act, how at one point much of Oklahoma, as we know it today, was all tribal nations? Well, this is this, oftentimes we talk about this pendulum swinging for the Supreme Court, so how they're ruling sovereignty or going against sovereignty. This would be a heavy pendulum swing in, in favor of sovereignty. And well, recognizing that, well, actually much of Eastern Oklahoma is still Native American lands. United States versus Cooley, 2021, tribal authorities can at least detain and investigate non-tribal members who are suspected of committing a crime. So even though they're not able to fully arrest in terms of that, we looked at the Oliphant versus Suquamish 1978 hearing. And in this case is saying, well, you can at least detain and investigate non-tribal members who are suspected of committing a crime. So still not full sovereignty, but it's trying to give um, some additional rights to uh, for carrying out sovereignty on people's tribal nations. The Nez Pay versus U.S., the federal government can prosecute a Navajo tribe member for a crime. The Court of Indian Offenses of Ute Mountain Indian, uh, Ute Mountain U Agency has already convicted him of. So in this case, again, saying it's not double jeopardy. They're allowed to have a tribal court 
in the U.S. court system. Oklahoma versus that overturned the long-held understanding that states do not have authority to prosecute non-Indians who commit tribes who commit crimes against Indians in Indian country. We then go to Holland versus Brackeen, which was June 15, 2023, by a 7-2 vote. The court rejected challenges to the Indian Child Welfare Act. So this was upheld, it was well too, in this 2023 ruling. This is just a, a case in Halleen versus Brackeen as well too, that it was being led by a pro bono Gibson Dunn. And Gibson Dunn had also done work for the Dakota Access Pipeline in terms of, so a lot of uh, some legal scholars had argued, native legal scholars particularly, that the ruling of, of, Bra of Halleen versus Brackeen of whether it was about the Indian Child Welfare Act a lot of what, what the, the foundational notions of that ruling of the case is the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, and that the people arguing against ICWA was saying, how, how is that Native people are given these rights if we're all having supposed to have this Equal Protection uh, Clause? While, again, ignoring this all this tribal history of tribal nations being here for millennia, supposed to have this nation-to-nation this -nation relationship. So really ignoring those ideas. And um, the notion was that it, it was, if if tribal if if tribal nations did not have sovereignty in ICWA, then this could be a uh, it could be taking down like a slippery slope for tribal nations and their sovereignty elsewhere when it came to sacred sites when it comes to tribal lands that could then be used for resources and could be used for commodification to really commodify sacred uh, sacred relationships to the earth and land here. So just noting that as well too that it wasn't just about the children that I've heard even Chief Justice. Angela Riley talk about that it was uh, this notion that it, it's, it was really about tribal sovereignty, an attack on tribal sovereignty. Arizona versus Navajo Nation, June 22nd, 2023. The pendulum swings back against tribal peoples. In a five to four decision, the, the th Supreme Court held that the United States owes no affirmative duty to the Navajo Nations to secure water. And if you're familiar with this issue, you can look more into it as well too. And there's a YouTube video called the Navajo Water Lady. And this is notion, and there's other videos and other resources out there as well too, but it's approximated between 40% to approximately 33% or so of people in the Navajo Nation do not have, or the Diné Nation, do not have access to running water. And uh, I thought surely once the Supreme Court finds out about this, you know, then then we can, then there'll be support for this, but it says there's no, they have no affirmative duty in terms of that. So an injustice that carries on. We're looking at some of these things of when we look at the definition of genocide being the purposeful extermination of a people's or cultures. This is from the Winona Daily Republican in 1863. And it's one of the first terms of this word, our skin, which is indeed a racial slur, as you can see on the screen here. I'm just going to read this here. The state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every, again, don't repeat this word, red skin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the dead, dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. So again, 1863, just looking at this, looking for the bounties, this extermination, attempted extermination, uh, genocide of Native peoples. Can we talk about that suprem supremacy clause of the Constitution, which is Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution? And it talks about, you can ignore the Roman numerals here, but it says the Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the constitution or laws of an of an state to the contrary, notwithstanding. So this is recognizing these 374 treaties that had gone through recognition of two-thirds approval through House of Representatives, two-thirds approval through the Senate, approved by the president. All of those have been broken in one way or another, even though they are the supreme law of the land. Looking at Native American bounties in California, these are some advertisements in the 1860s. These were offering $5 per decapitated head of indigenous peoples, 25 cents per scalp. The first year California rolled out this program, they pay out a million dollars. The second year that California rolls out the program, they pay out a million dollars. So um, anywhere from on the 25 cent side um, would be 8 million people on the highest end over, uh, over these years. And then on the lesser end would be around 400,000 people. So uh, a numbers of people who had been faced in this exter um, attempted extermination by state sanctioned genocide, bounties paid by the state of California to kill the, the people who are living here already. This is from August, 2021, 
on AP News where a Colorado governor voids an 1864 order to kill Native Americans. It's up until August of 2021, it was an order to kill Native Americans, which would then been overturned. This is Secretary of the Interior J.A. Krug signing a contract allowing the government to purchase 155,000 acres of land on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota. The sale was made without the consent of the reservation's business council chairman, George Gillette, who weeps as he watches Krug. This is his website, digitreaties.org, if you want to look at those 374 ratified Indian tre treaties visible for the first time. If you are a Native person, if you are an ally, and you want to look at these and see the different laws that, according to the Constitution, are the supreme law of the land, which tribal nations still have, this is a, a great resource for such. And I would definitely encourage you to use your legal skills for good in terms of being able to help peoples. This is an example from the Carlisle Indian School, and we'll talk more about this next class as well, too. But it's a notion that in here, like when my great grandfather was forced to attend school, uh, ran away twice, they never caught him the second time as they had agents who would go around trying to catch these students. It was signed by his parent or guardian. I mean, when I showed this to my relatives or my great uncle Ben, who has since passed, remember he laughed and he thought, he said, it was so interesting because you're, you know, you're my great, great grandparents, they didn't speak English, let alone write English, let alone write perfect cursive. So they're saying, well, we know for a fact this is a document which has been forged because my great -grand grandmother, Melissa, didn't speak English, let alone could she have written her signature in perfect uh, cursive. And when we go back to the treaties, I'm told that there are ways of different documents have been forged for signatures, that oftentimes people would be given alcohol to be put in an agreeable state of mind that people might forget. They'd be like, oh, wow, you don't remember doing what you did? Oh, you just did that. Or um, a number of different things, basically a lot of m many different forms of deceit were used to and what would later become as what are called bad papers when, uh, by different tribal nations, these treaties called bad papers. This is looking at the Indian Health Service and the sterilization of Native American women. This is an uh, article about it, giving a case study, uh, like an example of such and giving more details. And it's there's that, that Family Planning and Services Population Research Act of 1970 where 25% of Native American women of childbearing age or more had been given hysterectomies without their rightful knowledge or consent. And also um, other uh, Black and Latina women were also targets of this as well too. But in terms of that, that, that definition of genocide, the attempted destruction of a people's or cultures as well too, this would be an example of such as well. Occupation of Alcatraz, 1969 to 1971, led to different acts, which would eventually lead to domino acts of this Indian Self-Determination and Education Act of 1975, which would be um, a huge victory for tribal, tribal sovereignty and in terms of self-determination. There are still different activism and, and things in this resistance going on to this day, one of which is Resist Line 3. You can see it at resistline3.org, uh, that Enbridge off of stolen land. And this is breaking different treaties as well, as well too. This 1854, 1855, and 1867 treaty uh, threatening water, land, and wildlife. So again, this is breaking the supreme law of the land. This is in Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and this is in 2019 for the TMT, also known as the 30 meter telescope, known as a place sacred to native Hawaiians where the gods reside and saying, please do not do it here. We're asking you, please do not build upon this area as this is sacred to us. This is from the Dakota Access Pipeline. This was from a, uh, around November 2016 as well, too. And I just visited in January 2017 for a day. And I remember when I'd gone there, people said, uh, have you ever felt a rubber, rubber bullet before? So I've never felt a rubber bullet. I said, well, this is what they were shooting at us uh, on the front lines. And all these people were, were unarmed. When I went there, there was all these spray painted signs that said, um, your prayer is your weapon. And people were being shot at in sub-zero temperatures, literally, uh, with water hoses. And there's elders there. There's women there. There's children there. All different peoples there. And uh, just the notion that trying to protect Mother Earth, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when these oil pipelines break. And when they break, it makes the water undrinkable. It makes the land unusable. You cannot grow things on that anymore. So this was a, a heavy thing uh, as well, too. And it still, uh, still continues on. And I know in 2024, uh, there was even some of the, the, the commentary period was allowed, was opened up again by the Army Corps of Engineers on this project for the Dakota Access Pipeline. So, but it's still an ongoing, as uh, this had many different sacred sites for the people that were here as well too. And to my understanding, that when the Army Corps of Engineers, the Dakota Access Pipeline first came in 2016 to look at the sites, they were, they were asking, where are the sacred sites? And I'm told that many 
different people thought, oh, we're, we're going to tell the site so that they will be protected. Um, and then once the sites were found out about, I'm told that it was as soon as possible, they were they were uh, systematically destroyed by the Dakota Access Pipe, by the Dakota Access uh, Energy Transfer Company, who was uh, putting forth the Dakota Access Pipeline. And the old idea was, well, because there's no sacred sites here anymore, now you all have uh, no reason to have it as a sacred, this is no longer a sacred place. We can we can move through here. Even though it was supposed to initially go through Bismarck, North Dakota, people in Bismarck, North Dakota didn't want it. So it went around as well too. So just another example of such, of that defending the sacred. If you're on YouTube, you can check it out as well too. One of the playlists I've put together is called Protect the Sacred with a number of, a number of videos on there. You can check out and just seeing these different things for environmental justice that native people still fighting for. So I always appreciate and very honored to be at Vermont Long Graduate School where taking care of the environment is, is a huge responsibility. And I see that as a duty for myself as well too. Told you, which means I'm Turtle Clan in Oneida. And as Turtle Clan, our responsibility is to protect Mother Earth as well too, to take care of Turtle Island and this planet for all peoples for generations to come, seven generations to come. So we talk about John Trudell, this leader, he talks about how the people must take the political system under their control. And some different people as such doing that, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland of the Pueblo Laguna, who was a, a, before a congressperson, National Parks Director, Chuck F. Sams III, of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, who's made over 80 different tribal compacts with tribal nations and co-stewardship over national parks. Kansas's third congressional district, Representative Sharice Davids of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, and Paulette Jordan of the Coeur d'Alene Nation, who served in the Idaho House of Representatives from 2014 to 2018. Mary Peltola of the Yupik Nation of Alaska Native was the first person, uh, first Alaska Native in Congress in 2022. The first California Indian to be elected to the California State Assembly is James Ramos of the Serrano Cahuilla Tribe. First female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation is Wilma Mankeller of the Cherokee Nation. Now, there's this line from Prolific the Rapper says, every group of human beings shares the same stars. And if the earth is not your mother, are you from Mars? I love that call to action as well, too. So looking at our book of Navajo Nation peacemaking as well, too, and looking at what is peacemaking, if we look at the tribal courts website themselves and looking at what, how do we define these words? And I apologize as I, I am not fluent and not, pro, uh, not as proficient in the Diné language as well too. So if I mispronounce words, I, I, I do apologize. And I'm saying this with as much utmost respect as I can to pass on these ideas to you all, as I believe that it is very important to share. So the traditional Diné peacemaking courts begin in a place of chaos. Whether within an individual or between human beings, perhaps due to historical trauma, Navajos shy away from face-to-face -face confrontations. However, such confrontations are vital in order to dispel Hochko and Hatoi. The peacemaker has the courage and skill to provide the groundwork, groundwork for the person or group to confront Hochko and Hatoi and move toward mastering harmonious existence. Life value engagement with the peacemaker provides a sense of identity and pride from our cultural foundations. Hochko and Hatoi can block and overwhelm clanship. Hey, which is normally what binds humans together in mutual respect. Through engagement, the peacemaker educates, persuades, pleads, and controls the individuals or group for the readiness to open up, listen, share, and make decisions as a single unit using ke'e. When Hachki Anahotui is confronted, people may learn there is a choice to leave it. When harmony, when harmony hojo, is self-realized, sustaining it will have clarity and permanently hojo will be self self-attainable. And I apologize for mispronouncing. Through stories and teachings, the peacemaker dispenses knowledge, not to Aani, in order to pull toward a cathartic understanding of Hojo that opens the door to transformative healing. The flow of Hojo is a, mo a movement inward towards the core issue or underlying truth. Recognition of this truth and the ending of denial provide the opportunity for healing or mutual mending. Realization of the truth occurs when individual feelings are fundamentally satisfied. The resolution of damaged feelings is the core material of peacemaking sessions. Hojo o nata'a. Depending on the skill of the peacemaker, hojo may be this short or may take several peacemaking sessions. And also when talking about peacemaking as well too, there's the this Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations or the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee meaning the people of the Longhouse comprised of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and also the Tuscarora. They have a few videos on your Canvas module there, looking at them as well. And if you're curious about it, another YouTube playlist I've created is called Haudenosaunee Formation and Influence in the USA. 
You can look at those different videos as well too, to look at how these people came together in at least a late August 1142 or before. And we know this because of the solar eclipse that happens once every 240 or so years in the specific place you go to today in Victor, New York, which is a football field today, which at one point was this place where the Haudenosaunee and their longhouses had been for this meeting when they came together with the Peacemaker and Hiawatha and Jagonsa or Jagonse, depending, or Jagonsis, depending on the Six Nations description of the story is uh, how the name was pronounced for this woman, also known as the Mother of Nations, who she had a longhouse. And when these different tribal nations were, were previously at war with one another, that she had rules where people had to leave their weapons outside the door, that when they, when, they, when, they, when they were fed from the same bowl, the same bowl or the same spoon, that they became kin, they became family. So people who were trying to kill each other the day before, once they, when they walked out of there, were then kin or family, no longer trying to kill each other because they then became family by sharing a meal together. And eventually these people, uh, these five once warring nations would bury their weapons underneath this great white fir tree of peace and take up this notion of peacemaking. And even to this day, we still use community peacemaking as well too sometimes referred to as restorative justice, but oftentimes, especially specifically from Haudenosaunee perspective, looking back to where the great, the great law of peace, our peacemaker, we think of it as community peacemaking. And I, I like this, this is from the American Indian Institute. It's this notion that you're looking at the first draft of the constitution. It's not only the Haudenosaunee formation influential for native law, it's also influential for United States law and the over 185 other countries who have based their law off of a similar constitution from the United States, which was influenced by the Haudenosaunee. So this is what's called a wampum belt, and it's made of purple and white quahog shells, and they say different meanings and stories. And, and this one in particular is the great law of peace. And you can read it, you would hold it up like uh, from its right side, uh, being red would be the Mohawk, Oneida in the middle of the Onondaga, it's Cayuga, and then finally to the Seneca. Read the words here as inscribed below by the American Indian Institute. Before the idea of inalienable rights, liberty, and democracy were strung together in words, they were strung together in beads made of quahog shells in this Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Confederacy wampum belt. It represents 1,000 years of democratic principles that we Indians shared with our newer brothers and sisters, including Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, who openly acknowledged in speeches and in writing that our contribution formed the basis of the Constitution. And on a quick side note, you can see that in House Concurrent Resolution 331 from 1988, where our United States government recognizes that the, that the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois did in fact, in fact influence the form of governance as we know it today in the United States, which would be this form of federalism, checks and balances, this notion of we the people. And let me continue on with the reading here. We shared our belief that leaders should represent and serve the people, which was a startling belief in a world of kings and queens. We shared what we call the great law, which is the natural law of human dignity that precedes and underlies all other laws. Even we the people began as an ancient Indian phrase. It's important to, the, to the pursuit of all of our happiness that we the people now means and continues to mean we, all of us who are Americans. So I just wanted to share that as well too. And there's some different books and resources on that as well too. If you're curious about democracy and Indian nations, the US constitution, share this book, Exiled in the Land of the Free, a powerful text as well too. And some other books I'd highly recommend as well too, if you're curious on the subject matter, is the Encyclopedia of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy by Bruce Elliott Johansson and Barbara Alice Mann, some um, legal scholar, some um, academic scholars on the issue as well too. And also you can look at Bruce E. Johansson's Native American Political System and the Evolution of Democracy, an annotated bibliography, and many other resources as well too. For instance, if you want to pause the video here, you can look at some videos here, some different references about the Haudenosaunee influence, uh, another source of references here, if you want to pause and check those out. Take three if you're still curious as well too. And don't take my word for it, why not? Look at these resources as well too. Look at the Haudenosaunee influence on the United States Constitution. So if you all legal scholars or scholars of restorative justice or community peacemaking, I think it's very important looking at the roots as well too from for the Navajo court making process with Chief Justice, Justice Robert Yazzie who has transformed their court from a vertical system to a horizontal and for the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois or Six Nations from our community peacemaking for over a thousand years which still continues to this day I'm a practitioner of such going into different Six Nations communities and carrying this out as well too and can tell you that it's still practiced today. We talked about those some of those uh, in our first class as well too but it's a reminder including but not limited to some of those different restorative justice indigenous communities this Haudenosaunee Six Nations or Iroquois community peacemaking my Oneida relatives using an eagle feather fan while I hold with this you now. And in case you didn't know that when people 
uh, are sworn into a different office here in the United States that they can use a uh, religious text. Oftentimes you'll see a Bible, perhaps. Um, you know, an eagle feather is also used. We recognize that American Indian Religious Freedom Act. It's a, a sacred bird that flies the highest. It's never supposed to touch the ground. So I have an eagle feather box here that I keep inside of it from my great uncle who, who made it for me. And if, if you ever go to a powwow, the celebration of drumming and singing, and if ever any time an eagle feather drops to the ground, uh, the song will stop. Everybody will clear the powwow arena. They'll play a specific eagle eagle feather song where they'll have a veteran of a foreign war who's um, an Oneida person at our, at our powwow, but it'll be a veteran, of, a native veteran of a foreign war. We'll take this, an eagle feather staff, which is, has these eagle feathers while he's missing um, in action, a prisoner of wars. And they'll go and they'll dance at this feather from all four directions. And as they're dancing on it with a specific song, what is being said is this, this person is going into the spirit world to see if it's safe or not to pick up the feather. And once they go around, once eventually it is, if it is, you know, they'll pick it up and they'll raise it up and everyone will cheer. And then they'll, they'll have the decision of the person, that elder, to give it back to the person who dropped it. Um, or if, they re if, if, this, if the elder feels like they don't realize how sacred, how, how important this is, then they can choose to hold on to it themselves as well, too. And I've seen this a number of times in my life, dancing in powwows and different things. And probably out of, um, I don't know, out of like a number of times seeing it, I've probably seen like out of eight different times, I've probably seen like three or of those times when the specific song is happening, that eagles will like, will start like, like coming out of nowhere from the trees and they start like circling above the powwow arena, these eagles, like as that song is being played. So just a, a powerful uh, thing to witness and to experience as well too. I recommend oftentimes many powwows are open to all people. So whether if you're a native person or an ally, you can experience that for yourself as well too. And when I, as I compete in powwow dancing, the idea is you're supposed to be hearing the drum the same way that you're hearing your mother's heartbeat when you were in the womb for the first time. That all of us having been in our mother's heartbeat in our, um, at one being in our, our mother's womb for the first time, that that was the first drum beat we heard was our mother's heartbeat. So we look at the Apache using a burden basket, Lakota using a sacred pipe. And I apologize, mispronounce the Kwa Agwa Agwak. On indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest using a speaker staff, Akon chiefs in Western Africa using a linguist staff, Maori New Zealand have used a toko toko, a ceremonial talking stick. I want to finish our session here by talking about an imagined future, the story about a human's role from this Diné or Navajo elder named Arlie. And Arlie had told me the story that at one point all of creation was together. And when all of creation was together, there was this bear. This bear says, look what I can do. And this bear goes, boom, it takes a big tree, takes it out of the ground and throws it down. And this deer comes by and says, well, look what I can do. And this deer goes, boom, and it jumps over and it continues going. And it, it, uh, it jumps over and it is in one jump and it clears the, clears the tree. Well, this human being says, well, look what I can do. If I close my eyes, I can imagine a world like this one, only better. It's our responsibility as human beings to bring people to that imagined better place. So as I hold this eagle feather, some of the things I was taught is I'm never supposed to tell a lie, that everyone else you're listening as intently as you are when you're speaking, everyone you're sending the speaker good and loving thoughts. And when I'm holding on to this, I'm, I'm taking this, this perspective of an eagle, having this uh, the bird that flies above the clouds as a leader of all the other birds that it um, can see for miles as well too. So it's with that, I say to you, Yawonko Gadalunkwa Unugiwa, which means in Oneida, thank you, I love you, until next time. Looking forward to learning from your responses as well, too. Looking forward to reading, continuing all in our community peacemaking circle on GroupMe. And uh, take care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. If nobody has love for you, Dr. Reed has love for you. Take care of yourself, everybody. All the best.